South African National Cross Country Bike Action is proudly brought to you by Peps and Plastics and Yamaha. So this was it, the venue for the opening round of the 2020 tour. Lesotho and the Maluti Mountains, hopefully the Lowlands, would be the host of the flat out racing for the first day and first round of off-road and cross-country racing action. The locals were definitely in for a treat and the riders were as well. Look at that grass and the loam, it was going to be primo, perfect conditions to drop the hammer and go racing. There'd been a lot of chopping and changing in the off-season as well, and we were lucky enough to go down and catch up with a couple of the key players and see how they were feeling coming in to the new tour. Not just the rider, but organizer as well. We chatted to Sharon. Yeah, look, it's very difficult. I won't lie. I think I bit off more like a chew deciding to race and committing to the championship and hosting it. Uh, but we've got a good team at Live Lesotho. Everyone else has stepped up to take in the, the gap that I obviously filled. Um, so confident in what they can do. And through Altus as the route director and uh, the whole family being involved with it, I think we can pull it off. So it's exciting from an organizing standpoint and from a racing standpoint. It's, it's Lesotho. I love it. It's my home. I grew up riding here. So looking forward to, you know, riding in the mountains. And last year's high school champion, former Mr. 125, now onto the OR3s. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I uh, love riding my 250 and I uh, love Lesotho, so hopefully it will come together and uh, I'm looking forward to it today. And reigning OR2 champion who stays on the box, Jazz Kutsia. Yeah, we, we finished off really strong last year and, um, and we managed to grab the snatch the title out of the jaws of defeat, so um, I was really stoked with that. Um, but ultimately it, uh, it motivated me for this year and we're carrying a bit of momentum coming into this year. Um, not quite the number one, I got the second overall last year, so not too much weight on my shoulders, uh, but obviously the target's on my back for this year in the class. Um, but I'm expecting a, a challenge from all the boys, the Brett Swanner pulls back as well as uh, Gareth Cole, so you know it's going to be a, a challenge out there and uh, I'm expecting a fight. Brad Cox nailed down his number one plate last year, he was looking for more again. Uh, you know, we've done good preparation this off-season and, uh, you know, I've got a great team behind me, the Brother Leadership KDM team, and, yeah, I think I'm on the best bike, so ready to get this, uh, yeah, this year started, you know, and, and I'm excited for today. I love Lesotho. Uh, it just feels like the other day we were here with the roof, so, um, yeah, looking forward to the day. The briefing was going to be interesting as well. Everyone was told how the laps and how the racing was going to run. It was definitely going to be more technical than the flat-out races from the past, and the medics were key as well as in these open mountains, survival was going to be paramount. The riders tuned in and you could see they were a little bit worried. Altus had laid out a Perla, but it was going to be definitely a lot of up and downs, technical and a lot less fifth gear pinned than the riders were used to. Um, at the back you're going to go on top of that ridge. There is a bit of the time trial was going to be an epic start as well. 200 meters out the gate and you went up the Widowmaker. It was going to be spectacular for the riders and spectators alike. Even though the course was marked, it was going to be GPS as well. So a couple of riders, it was going to be new school racing. Charon Moore was the first rider to go out there and hopefully his local knowledge would help him out. One or two riders would try and tag onto the back wheel of the big guy. Remember, it was Charon who took the final win of 2019. So he's coming into this round with a lot of momentum. The first climb up the Widowmaker told the rest of the riders whether they could hit it pinned in third or whether they had to dance all the way up on the revs in second. Cole, a rider from KZN, would have felt very at home in this terrain. He was very sad about losing his championship at the end of 2019 on the flatlands of Gauteyn. So back into the mountains, feeling a little bit more KZN and good about the project. Jason Fender had just come off his first ever GXCC win one week earlier, so it was going to be a big threat in the OR2 gate going forward into the rest of this tour. As some of the pros went up the Widowmaker, down in the pits, Ian Pepper shared his thoughts about the event. Well, I don't know. I didn't sign up for the roof of Africa. Um, <laughs> if I get up there without stalling or making a football of myself, I'll be quite happy. I think a lot of the flat out riders were very concerned about how technical the track was going to be. The time trial was laid out as a relatively short one, 30 kilometers, but with an average speed of probably under 30 kilometers an hour, it was certainly going to be a hard start to proceedings. We caught up with reigning Masters champion, one of the old schoolers, Wayne Farmer. No, very different. And yeah, talk about we used to this. I haven't done tech for about two years now. So we're going to be in for a big shock, uh, two Ks, I mean, 200 meters from the start now. So yeah, let's uh, all wake up very quickly. 
Wayne always valve bouncing straight out the gate. Darren Gray had made the move across onto the Yamahas, moving onto the 2020 Tour. So he was on the 250 Smoker and would definitely be a big threat in the support classes as he eased his way up the big mountain. For D. Gray, traction on the Yami is not a problem. So Pepper eyed up how everyone was approaching it and this was his chance to try and just run clean. For Pepper, he just wanted to crest the Widowmaker and carry on the rest of his day. Remember, Pepper is a former motocross champ from back in the day. And for the last couple of seasons, been finding his feet on the off-road tours. He didn't want to go all the way up in the mountains. For him, he wanted to go flat out. Slightly offline at the top of the ridge there, he was going to have another bite of the cherry. He at least got out of the gate, though. Some riders lining up and discovering lastminute.com punches. And it was all hands on deck before the rider could swing a leg. One or two more riders at the top of the Widowmaker. Looked like it was uh, Vaynard Dalport and Harry Krobler joined Pepper. And one by one, they made it up. The locals, though, said, we could have cleaned that easy. You don't go left, you go straight. Come the end of time trial, though, we started to see the riders coming in one by one. It had taken them a long time as well for a 30K loop, but at least they had a little bit more idea of what the rest of the day was going to hold, how to set up their bikes, maybe change a click here and there on the suspension and get locked and loaded. Everyone was here for the beginning of the 2020 tour to get as many points on the plate as possible. Join us after the break as we move forward into the full race format. Welcome back to the action from the South African National Cross Country Bike Championship, proudly brought to you by Pepsi and Plastics and Yamaha. With the time trial done and dusted, everyone formed their lines up in the queue and would go out and do the chase down. Cox had set himself up perfectly to line up inside of the top five and try and chase down on the overall. Brett Swanepoel was back up to full speed and Sharon Moore, as well as King Kenny, were there to set about nailing down their championships. Nerves were definitely starting to pick up in the queue. Last minute setups on the bikes. Van Deventer in the off season had made the change across onto the Yamahas. And on the sidelines, it was a bit of note taking from Widehand and Alfie Cox himself. The timekeepers were good to go. The riders were locked and loaded and Sharon Moore was the first rider to drop the clutch, drop the hammer. And he was gonna try and see no one else for the rest of the day. Cox was gonna be on, as he likes to say, the small bike, but he has made the 250 his own category. And sometimes in the tech terrain, the smaller bike can pay the bills and bring you all the way. Brett Swanepoel was back onto the gate as well on the Peps and Plastics factory Husqvarna and he was going to be a massive threat to try and take away the title from Jazzman. Jazz was running the number two plate, although he was reigning champion, crowned at the end of 2019 on the OR2s. Van Deventer likes to see what he can do and I think this may be his season as well. If he can stay injury free, he's one of those riders that can grip it and rip it. Taki Bodjogis has come back from some big back injuries two seasons ago and was going to be a rider to watch out for. Definitely a podium threat. Then Mikey Pentecost, who had done a miracle ride just one week ago on one of the regional events with almost no brakes, but his aggressive style may not be the right approach. Scotty Haygate making the switch across from motocross was definitely going to be a rider to watch out for as he starts to make the very difficult move from groomed motocross tracks to natural terrain. We go on board with Scotty as he crests the Widowmaker. From Zambia, but schooled in KZN, so this kind of riding terrain will feel semi-similar, and we do see a lot of KZN guys perform really well when we go out into the mountains. With no Bali Van Royen, it was an open gate as far as the Seniors Championship went, and last year's runner-up was Wade Blau. He was gonna be the man to watch as he took, looked like Dot, all the way up to the Widowmaker. They'd be working well together in the early stages of lap number one. Spectators lined the Widowmaker and were enjoying the show. They would mission out onto some of the flatland sections to try and catch up with some of the pinning riders. But it was in the early stages at least, very technical, with around about a 35 kilometer average speed of our top pros as everyone, one by one, cleared the gate. Lines started to form on the Widowmaker, making things a little bit easier further down the queue and it did allow some of the support riders a little bit of extra breathing room. One of the local yokels, who got his mixture slightly wrong, but his riding style paid him back in spades as he made a lot of the pros look very amateur as he cleaned the Widowmaker on his first go. 
With pro categories, support categories, and a couple of juniors making the trip up to Lesotho, it was going to be nice to just kick off that dust and get loose and get going. Yes, indeed, this is a off-road and cross-country race, but it does look like some of the lower land sections of the roof of Africa. Some of the high-speed pinners would have been caught napping coming into this kind of terrain. Some of the multitask riders who race in both championships would have had a very early advantage in this type of terrain. Almost looks like baboons from the roof of Africa a couple of seasons back. Tristan Purton had made a double contract signing in the off-season. He was going to race motocross and national off-roads as well. This would be his first trip ever up into the mountains of Lesotho. Taki was running nice inside of the top 10 and also just easing his way back into it. Didn't want to make any mistakes in the early part of the season as the rest of the riders just started to feel their way around. This was underneath the Roma Bridge as well, so an area that a lot of the Roof of Africa competitors know and confirms that we were staying in the lowlands. Ian Rawl, who's definitely a championship threat in the OR2 category, was staying one position ahead of Wade Blau. Blau is a bit of an old school rider, so he'll have known how to attack the terrain in off-road and tech like this as well. Like I said, we also had the junior categories going out there. Johnny Luck was gonna be one of the riders to watch out for. He'll have definitely had a small town advantage knowing the home terrain, but we had around about seven or eight juniors making the trip up there and they had their own specific route to go, which was much more flatland than the pro senior riders. But great to have the juniors along on the tour. Remember, it's aspirational racing this as well. So the juniors get to pit with the factory pros as well. And maybe one season, get to go and race against their heroes. <laughs> Time for a snack up in the mountains with the Basutu people as we go down into the riverbeds once again to catch up on Ryan Peltzer. He was running a top 10 in the overalls and trying to fight hard for a top five on the category. This season, the OR3s, that's a 250 class, was gonna be an absolute nail biter with a couple of high schoolers moving up and keeping things nice and busy. That's the ripper, Ryan Ripley, who's moved up into the factory squad for Husky and Dylan Cox, one of the RBS Yamaha boys, looking good on the 125. High schools also is gonna see a new champion this year with a lot of riders moving up. Wilson was running two spot at this stage. Another rider on the fly as well, coming back into the pro ranks, was Vaynard Dalport, a new signing to the CIT Factory Husky Squad and trying to chase down a top five. Hunter Simon was there as well, trying to stay inside the top three for the seniors. And Butterbean, D. Gray, was doing a rock and roll job on the 250 Yamaha. Farmer was getting the job done. Untouchable on the Masters Gate at this stage. Back on board with Scotty Haygate as we flew down into the lowlands. That looked like he just made the pass on Van Dierventer, who was starting to fade backwards, and Scotty was starting to find his groove. But once again, we would go into some of the crazy passes. But no one was going to get lost. Altus de Vet and his crew did a stellar job of marking. Everyone was running GPS, but that was just backup. Pentecost, unfortunately, missed one of the lines. Tried to go a hot line through the river, drowned his bike completely. He was going to be biting his fingernails to try and stay in it. But it looked like it was all over for Pentecost, who was having a great comeback up until that point. For the seniors, Akim Bergman had moved up into the factory squad. JC Nienoba wasn't enjoying life in the mountains. Someone else was, though. The chopper was getting some great shots of what was going on in the lowlands. Riders weren't pinned, which meant everyone was starting to group nicely. And some of the riders that weren't too happy with navigation were starting to just live on the back wheel of each other and find their way through come the end of lap number one. Wide Hand was doing a little bit of martial work, making sure no one else drowned their bikes, setting them down the sweet spot into the riverbed, staying away from the wet stuff. This was Pentecost. It looked like it was game over for the guy that was probably going to rock his way through up to a top five. Can't even explain what happened. Just slid off the flipping rock, drowned the bike underneath the water, race over. Okay? And that is what Lesotho can do to you. Last year, the guys got a taste of it as Lesotho did host a round of the national championships just over the halfway marker of 2019. So the guys that went up there last year will have had a definite advantage for Scotty Haygate. This was his first trip to the mountains, even though we stayed into the lowland sections. And as the lap went on, Scotty was starting to look pretty tasty. Not a bad place to grab a little bit of building rubble as well down in the riverbeds. Moddy Pool. One of the most consistent riders out there racing off-roads and enduros will have known exactly how to approach this event. Calm and steady is what Lesotho requires. 
If you try and pin it, you will be punished. No problems for our race leader though, Charon Moore was making his way down towards the end of lap number one with no one anywhere near his tailpipe. Looked like the Live Lesotho Roost KTM man was going to get gone. The fight for second place was starting to heat up quite nicely. Brett Swanepoel had started to look comfortable in the two spot, but Brad Cox was building pace and starting to catch up. In the motocross section, Chan was doing a great job of putting on a show for the spectators, bringing all his ISDE experience to the fray. Cox was on a ripper as well. Confirmed that he'd moved up into the number three spot and was nowhere near being caught by anyone else. The rest of the riders were really challenged to try and hold the pace of the top three as they neared the end of lap number one. Cox was just building pace the whole way through, clearly one of the faster riders in the motocross section just before the end of the lap and coming into the pits. We're gonna take a small break with a small message. Back into the Lesotho Mountains and the Malutis were once again delivering the goods. Etienne Sabrant was running the Yamaha up into a number four spot at this stage for the high schools as the riders continued their onslaught in the mountains. The weather was starting to loom large as well, but for now, everyone was living on and living strong. For Rippers, he didn't get to unleash the big power underneath his right wrist, but he was still going to bring home a nice finish. For the high schoolers, Matty Wilson was doing a good job in the number two spot, and he had his good buddy, teammate, but now moved up to the OR3s, Dav Cocker, on his wheel. Insane Wayne Farmer was doing a great job, and Aki was on his wheel, racing out of Masters and Seniors category, respectively. For Jay Fenter, he was a little bit too tech for one of the Flatland pinners, and he was going to battle to stay inside of a top five for the OR2s. For D Gray, he'd done a great job as well. He was just outside of a top five at this stage in the OR2 category, running a top six. Marco Kochi was inside of a top five for the Seniors gate with one lap to go if his bike would make it. Out on course with the rest of the competitors completing lap number one. The day was starting to get long and riders were starting to really feel it. Sore wrists on the side of JC Nienaba. He was another rider coming back from injury on the bounce. He would walk away with the finish come the end of play, but the story was this tight battle where Brad Cox, the leading small bike, had now caught up to Brett Swanepoel. This was a battle on the road for second place overall. Jazz Kutsia was confident that he was going to be able to walk away with a second place in the OR2s and a top five in the overalls. He just wanted to stay out of trouble, stay out the way, and bring home some nice points to build on his championship. Gareth Cole had found his groove halfway through lap number one and was starting to improve lap times, getting himself up to control the number three spot on the OR2 gate. This forest section and the loam was just absolute butter. King Kenny was outside the top five overall, but still running second place in the open OR1 class for the former champ. This is just getting himself nice and loose. When the season gets longer, Kenny will get faster. Second place is a great place to start though. On board once again with our cameraman, Scotty Haygate doing some great work, giving us the footage in the lowlands and the forest to show how butter this track really was. Forest and loam is just perfect riding conditions. And again, very KZN. The brawler who likes things flat out and wide open. If he could put seven gears on his bike, he would but he was also improving pace. Stefan van Deventer looked like he may have had a crash and was slow on the pace. He still held on to third, but that was going to get taken away from him as Dav Cocker found his groove and was about to catch up to the Yamaha man. Another Yamaha was on the pace. Dylan Cox was rocking and rolling on the RBS Yamaha 125 as leader in the high school gate. And it was an outright lead in the seniors for Wade Blau. No one anywhere near his back wheel. It was the same in the Masters, where Wayne Farmer wrapped up shop. That was friggin' gnarly. For off-road, that's like a, a Enduro. I think tomorrow we're going to be in for a Super Enduro. But no, um, just kept a good pace. Made some stupid mistakes. It was lost once or twice, but got back on route. And, but you just had to, you couldn't race it today. Just ride a good pace and you'll make it to the finish. Old school pays the bills. Farmer walking away with another win. For Palza, he was in the groove as well, looking really tasty as far as the OR3s went. Taki was also very comfortable trying to chase down and remain inside that top five for the OR2s. 
Eric Merry was also just outside the top five as far as the OR3s go. And then Vaynard Delport on the newly signed CIT Husky squad was now getting himself up to challenge for a top three in the pro OR1 gate. That was an amazing ride and only his first time out in Lesotho. This is our race leader then, heading into the end of his lap. Charon was just on fire. Remember, he'd taken the final win at the end of 2019. The second place battle had heated up as well, with Cox now getting himself up ahead, pulling around about 15 seconds out of Swanepoel. But that battle was nowhere near over. The top four looked like they were wrapped up and confirmed as Jared came into sight, managing that number four spot and running a two spot as far as the OR2s go. For Kenny, he looked very comfortable and controlled. Second place was a happy start to him. Scotty Haygate was ripping it as well. He'd now confirmed himself as a two spot in the OR3 category. And Scotty had definitely turned the page from motocross to cross country and off-road. The martial points were absolutely perfect as always, playing the game. And the Live Lesotho crew had to take a big bow for putting an amazing event together at this stage of the game. The clouds were still hanging, but for now the riders were staying relatively dry, except for the little river crossings that was. Third place in the OR2s, Gareth Cole, a two-time champion of the category, lost his plate last year, and he's going to have to fight super hard to try and retain it. Stefan van Deventer had recovered from his issues at the halfway marker of the race, and he was still going to bring home a finish. The brawler, Ian Rawl, not a podium this time, but it would be a bag full of points to try and stay in the hunt before some of the terrain turned to his advantage. Taki, similar situation. Just needed to get out of the mountains and into the flatlands before he could bring home the results he knows he is capable of. Fenner Dalport seemed to be just getting himself nice and loose as the day went on. Definitely a rider that worked on his off-season training. And then Dav Marais. One of the top Yamahas on the 450s, trying to chase down a top five. For Hunter Simon, he was eyeing up one of his best ever national finishes, a multi-tasked rider, and definitely the format of today's race would have played into his hands. Some of the locals also making their way down towards the end of their first racing lap. As they finished though, Charon was about to complete his event. You could hear from the wind on the cameras there. The wind was pumping, the weather was arriving, but it was Charon Moore that arrived at the flag first to take his win. Oh, yes. Oh, it's unbelievable. Uh, it's, it's a long time coming. So stoked. It feels so cool. And, you know, this one's for everyone that's helped, that uh, made it possible for me to ride today. So stoked. The cracking ride for Charon Moore as the rest of the riders made their way towards the end of lap number one. That was going to be their day because they'd gone a lap down. But the dice for second was what we were watching. Swanepoel had made the pass on Cox and he was going to have to really battle. It had been this close for about 10 Ks to go before the end of the lap, and Swanepoel was not going to give it up. This was for second place overall and for the lead. Whoever got the power down first was going to bring it all the way to the line. Brett Swanepoel confirms that he is back at full race pace and full fitness. He took the flag to get the check-ins at second place. Cox gets third, and that's the win in OR2s and OR3s. The last, Brad and I pretty much raced the whole race together, dicing, and on the last lap I thought, flip, I don't, I'm not sure if I really want to race until the end, because I want to try and save a bit of energy for tomorrow, and then we like kind of, I just try to keep him in the distance, and like he'd open the gap and I'd have to work really hard to try and close, and then near the end, yeah, he made a little, he turned a bit late, and um, I managed to just slip in in front of him, and then we managed to just dice it out till the end and the 2019 reigning small bike champ tells his story too. Yeah, I got um, qualified second and then uh, Brett was just behind me and we, we pretty much uh, rode together the whole day. Like, we just rode together and then I managed to pull about 15 seconds on him on this last lap and then uh, Brett closed me down and then uh, I just made a mistake just before the last mountain and he got me and then, yeah, we were banging bars on this MX test now to the end, but no, happy. Class win, that's obviously the main goal, and uh, yeah, top three overall and small box always nice. So out of Lesotho, here's confirmation of the results. Charon Moore tops the charts ahead of Kenny Gilbert. Delport, Nienaba, and Delanger made the top five, and then Marais, Purden, and Ripper. They'll score points all the way down to the magical number eight. 
Checking out the ultra-competitive OR2s, Brett Swanepoel confirms his status as top dog. Jazz could see a reigning champ in the number two spot ahead of Cole, the brawler, Bodge Hodges, Darren Gray, the top Yamaha smoker in the number six spot ahead of J-Dog Fenter and De Kriff. In the OR3 class, great riding out of Brad Cox and a strong overall as well, Scotty Haygate. Epic ride into the two spot ahead of Cocker, Van Diemeter, Pelzer, Mary, Fulyun, and Hayden Cole. A low finish for a guy that should be running inside the top threes. For the seniors class, Wade Blau came out swinging. No bolly, but it's the Roost KTM this time on top as Blau goes ahead of Simon Kennedy and Bergman, with Wayne Farmer taking the Masters win ahead of Poole, Burning, and Big Harry Krobler. Into the high schools then, where we will crown a new champion in 2020. It was Dylan Cox on the RBS smoking Yamaha, ahead of Wilson, McKenzie, and Zebrant. And Kerbis Bester walked away with the junior win, ahead of Vandermeerve, Zebrant, and Clock. So that's round one wrapped up in a bow. The next round moves down to KZN on the 18th of April. We'll see you guys down there. The South African National Cross Country Bike Racing Action was proudly brought to you by Pepsin Plastics and Yamaha.